Psalm 145. Interesting message today. Looking forward to preaching this. Guess what? It's going to be about Jesus again, so that's all right with me on a Sunday morning. Amen. How many of you believe today that Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords? I believe that. It's a wonderful truth to know. You go in a world here that's all messed up. Don't know which way's up. A lot of people try to make themselves to be these great rulers and leaders and we just see all their fallacies and their faults. You know, it's, it's good news to know that our king is not only above all other kings, but he's a perfect king. He's a wonderful, wonderful savior, the Bible says. And that gives us hope, doesn't it? You know, we can pray for our leaders and we can pray for our country, but in the end, we're going to be disappointed unless we remember Jesus is going to come and settle it all and make it straight one day. And what he's going to be setting up here on this earth is going to be a wonderful, wonderful thing to be a partaker in and part of. And I am glad that I know I'm going to be part of that kingdom. Aren't you glad today if you're saved? that You, you have hope, not just in this world, like, oh, you know, man, if we could just get the right president in there. Well, that helps if he's a God-fearing man, but it's not the answer to everything. Amen. We know really the one we'd love to vote for every year every four years when it comes to choosing a president would be King Jesus. And that would just settle it all. Amen. But the good news is when it comes time for him to sit on his throne, there's not going to be no democratic or republic way of bringing him into office. He's already been put in. There are no votes. Amen. He has already been declared the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we're going to get into a little bit of that today. Um, we look at Psalm 145, verse 13, just one verse here to sort of springboard us, much like a diving board into our message, talking about the kingdom of our God. The Bible uses the word kingdom a lot, doesn't it? The kingdom, the kingdom, that is to say, oh, the rule, you know, the, the place of authority, the, the kingdom that's set up. Psalm 145, verse 13, thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. You know, it's interesting before we get into our message today to think about who is God? Well, He is the King of heaven and earth. You know, the Bible tells us that the earth is God's footstool and heaven is His throne. Think about that. There's a throne in heaven where God sits, but heaven is God's throne and the earth is His footstool, just like you've got that chair at the house. You sit in that chair, and then you've got your feet stretched out sometime on one of them fancy footstools. God says that's what the earth is like unto Him. So if He's King of Heaven, I'm certain today that He's also King of this earth. Now, sometimes it might not seem that way. We say, oh man, what's going on around here? And we find that God has a way throughout generations that He's allowed man to have His kingdoms and rule here as kings. But we also find that one day he is going to sit and reign on the throne of David in Jerusalem as the king, as the king. And we're grateful for that. And many verses in the Bible talk about that. I do believe this is one of the reasons why they rejected Jesus is because they were asking often, wilt thou you know, establish thy kingdom in Acts chapter 1. He said, are you going to do it now? And Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons. Let's go to there for a minute. Just Acts chapter 1 here. Read some things that's not in my notes, but it's important to understand. Do you know that the first time Jesus came was not to be the king of this world? A lot of people thought it was going to be that way. In fact, they didn't quite understand because if this is the Messiah whom the Bible says in the book of Psalms would dash the pieces, the, da, dash the people of this earth in pieces like a potter's vessel. If he was the one that was going to come and make the heathen his inheritance, why is it that it seemed he was so meek, he was so lowly? In fact, he allowed people to kill him. That's why when they, he hung there on the cross, they said to him words like this, if thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. If, you're, if you say that you've come to save us, then come down and then we'll believe. I mean, it would make sense that, that if he was the king, that's what he would do, right? No king would die, but this king did. 
So it's, it's, it's interesting to think about the way of a king. A king would never have done the things that Jesus did. That's what I want to talk about here today. The way of a king. Acts chapter 1, we find here in Acts chapter 1, verse number 6, When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, Jesus, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Hey, you're our king. You just proved it by raising from the dead. Is this it? It's time, right? Look what Jesus said. He said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. And so here we're thankful that God put a what we would refer to as a New Testament time, a period where men and women could be saved like you and I. And I know this sounds crazy, but I'm thankful that Jesus did not establish his kingdom at that time. I'm glad he came to die for the sins of the world to be the Savior and not the King in his first coming. And so that was a lot of the confusion, the Jews and the priests and the the, the people there, the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees, they said, well, this doesn't make any sense. He's to be the king. He's to rule them with a rod of iron. He's to dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Where is this great king? And you know, that's the way of a king. In fact, if you study the Bible, it says that the king's word is with power. Now, think about that for a moment. The king's words could do anything and had authority to do anything. If a king said it, it was done. If a king said, you're going down, they were down. They were done. In fact, sometimes they didn't even need to speak. They just held out their scepter, and that meant mercy. And if they dropped their scepter, that meant wrath and judgment and the end of that person. So think about this today, the way of a king, and the fact that I believe Jesus is the king of kings and lord of lords. He will always be the king of king and lord of lords. He always was in heaven, in his throne before But just for a moment in time, let's go to Luke chapter 2 here and consider something. Luke chapter 2. The life of Jesus doesn't really line up to the way of a king. Luke chapter 2. Which should develop a thought in our mind. If he didn't come like a king, why not? Luke chapter 2 here. Let's look at some things. In Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1. Now, if I was a king today, and you were to be a king today, where would you like to be born? My first thought is, if a king has a son, well, the king is born in the palace. Amen? He's coming into a place of prominence. Not this king. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 2, in verse number 1, that Mary and Joseph here, it came to pass, verse 1, in those days there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Verse 3, and all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Which is an interesting word, by the way. Bethlehem means house of bread. It's a pretty neat word there because he was of the house of the lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. We know what that means, about nine, nine and a half months. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in the king's palace. I mean, that's the way of the king. No, just a manger, just a barn. You know, it's... It's interesting because we, if we were a king, and to be a king, one would be born into a palace, not this man. He was born to a barn, a stable, a manger, a place of no preeminence whatsoever. You know what is also interesting? You would think the way of a king would not only be born in a place that's a palace and luxurious and great and magnificent, but also you would think that he would be born of people of great nobility. That's the second thing I think about. Not only where a king would be born, into the house he would be born, but greater than that, the people to whom he would be born. You know, that's how it works today. Whether you know it or not, many of our presidents come from a certain lineage, if you study it back. They were born into that place, even in America. It's even more seen in England and places like that, where you're either in or you're out. You're in a great class or you're not in a great class, right? We understand that today. So we would think a king would be born unto a certain class of people. 
not Jesus. Not only was he not born in a palace in a place of preeminence, but a barn, a manger, as the Bible says, but he was also born to people that were not of royalty, that were not of nobility. In fact, in their day, they would not have been people of class. They were simply Jews, poor, and from all places, a place called Nazareth. <laughs> Nazareth. In fact, Nazareth was such a city of disgrace that even Nathaniel, a believer of God's word and in the salvation that Jesus was to be for the nation of Israel, when was told of Jesus, they said, we have found him who is called the Christ. And they're like, wow, that's great. Said, that's great. And they said, come see him. Okay, let's go, go meet this man. And he goes, Nazareth? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? What? Not only was he born in a, in a place that was not a palace, but he was also born in a place that was not Jerusalem. Not Jerusalem. You would think that's where the king would be born. No. He came out of Nazareth, of all places. And born in this place called Bethlehem out of a city called Nazareth, which at that place, at that time, was a fishing port city, which was of no good reputation, not a place of royalty, not a place of nobility, not a place of class. And interesting enough, Mary and Joseph were poor people themselves. In Luke chapter 2, when we turn the page in her Bible, if you do turn the page, we find that when they came, in verse number twenty. Two, and when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. A dedication here, if you would. And as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. So they were to, to get, dedicate this firstborn son, just as the Old Testament said. But watch this. To offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons. Well, if you study your Bible, you'll find out that dedication right there, that was a poor man's dedication. These two people hardly had two nickels to rub together. A pair of turtle doves. That is to say, what we would call today the pigeon of that family. That's all they had. That's all they could afford. Now, I mean, you would think that Jesus, being the King of kings and Lord of lords, would choose a people of more prominence, a place of, a, a place of people that would have a, a royalty and nobility and people of class. That's the way of a king. No, Jesus chose to be born to these, if you would, peasants of their time. What a king. Not what we would think. You know what the Bible tells us something very interesting? that this king of kings came into this earth and the kingdom that he would establish would be greater than all kingdoms than before. Let me, let me go back here to Daniel just for a moment. Let's read some verses together about this kingdom. Daniel. Now, if you know the story of Daniel, there is a king and he has a vision. And he sees this great, great image and in that image is seen four kingdoms. Daniel chapter number two, please. In that image is seen four kingdoms. And if you study down through the time, you'll find out it is four kingdoms that were here on this earth. Nebuchadnezzar, Alexander the Great, or also known as the Babylonian kingdom, Alexander the Great, the Medes and the Persians, or the Grecians, and then also the Roman kingdom. Four kingdoms are seen. All of those kingdoms have come to great power over the rest of the kingdoms that are here on this earth. And the Bible tells us, though, that Jesus would be part of a kingdom and God would establish a kingdom here on earth that would destroy all other kingdoms that came before. Read with me here about this. Daniel chapter 2, verse 31. Daniel saying to the king of his dream or vision, Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image, this great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron, part of clay. Now watch verse 34. Talking about this King of kings and Lord of lords. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. 
Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. What does that mean? Like they would garner the wheat and they would, they would winnow that wheat and the chaff would just go away in the wind. That's what God is saying about these four kingdoms that would come before the kingdom of, of Jesus here on earth. And it says, And the stone that smote the image became a great, don't miss that, Mountain. Mountains are, are pictures in the Word of God, symbolic of kingdoms, and filled the whole earth. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof. Thou art a king of kings. Now, please stop for a minute. You know, Jesus is called the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We'll see that in a minute here in our Bible. But did you know that, that anyone who ruled over a kingdom, over the other kingdoms of the earth, in these four kingdoms, could also be referred to as king of kings. But you'll notice the word here is a little k and a little k. So it shows to us that these kingdoms would be over the rest of the kingdoms of the world. And there would be four distinct king of kings, little k's, for those periods of time. But ultimately, there would be one king of kings in the end that would rule over and take over this entire earth. The Bible says that here in verse 37. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field, the fowls of the heaven, hath he given in thy hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. After thee there shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. Verse number 43, And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. The democratic way, I believe, of what we're living in. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Verse 44, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall be not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand for ever. So the Bible tells us here that the God of heaven is declaring to us that there is going to be a kingdom of which there will be no end, which will destroy all kingdoms before, and of course we know that Jesus is that king. So when we come to our New Testament and we see Jesus in the book of Luke, being born to the manger doesn't really seem to make sense for that king. When we see him being born to Mary and Joseph, peasants, people of no royalty, nobility, or class, we have to ask ourselves, this doesn't make sense. This isn't the way of a king. And as we read on in our Bible, we find more concerning this. Go with me to Matthew 21, and we'll spend the majority of the rest of our time there today. Matthew 21. I mean, don't you think at some point he could have went to the palace said, uh, I deserve to be sitting there. That's yeah, interesting. I don't know if we'll get this today, but the Lord was not impressed with any earthly kingdoms. That's not what it was about. Matthew 21, begin reading there, if you would, verse number 10. When he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, who is this? Now go back to verse 9, and we'll see what happens here. Now, certainly, I mean, come on, think about this. At this point, we have a man who has healed people of their diseases. He has cast out devils. He has raised the dead. He has done, the Bible says, he went about doing good. Never would you ever consider anyone in this world being ever better than Jesus Christ. He was a good man. Certainly, we would think at this point when he came into Jerusalem in this triumphal entry, as it's often referred to, that now finally this king would take the place that he rightfully can take. But notice in verse, 20, verse 9, The multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Then the Bible says, Verse 15, when the chief priest and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. Now, wouldn't you think at this point the king would step up and say, it's time. I lived 30 years in secret. 
now I've lived openly for over three years, doing good, casting out devils, healing people of their diseases, giving sight to the blind, giving hearing to the deaf. Certainly, now he could be that king. No. No, the Bible tells us here, if you would, verse 17, watch this. And he left them and went out of the city into Bethany, and he lodged there. Not only was he not born into a palace or a people of nobility, royalty, and of class, just peasants, but you know, when he was given the opportunity, he said, no, I'm not come here to be the king. I'm here to be the Savior. You know what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 11? Look at this, Matthew chapter 11. We'll hold your finger here, Matthew, because we'll be back. He left the city. How many of you believe that Jesus had all authority at that point? He could have done, sat as the king. That was his nation. He said, how often would I have gathered thee like a hen gathers her chicks? He had all authority as the king. But he didn't. He did something else. Go to Matthew uh, chapter 11, verse 28. And I want you to read something here that's very interesting about our king. And I, I don't want to miss this because it is part of my message. Christian, sometimes you think when you get saved, everything's just going to be great. And everything's going to be subject to you. And everything's going to work out great just because God made all these promises in your life. Dear friend, if you're going to go the way of the king, because the Bible says you'll rule and reign with him, you know where it puts you? You know where you, know where you end up if you go the way of the king? You end up at the cross. Now, that's deep, friend. As Christians, you know, we get saved, we think this is it. My life's perfect. Everything's going to be wonderful. The whole world's going to be subject unto me. I'm not going to have any problems. I'm not going to have any issues. People are going to respect me. People are going to put me in that place of prominence and preeminence and I'm a Christian and I love God and I'm part of the citizen of heaven, citizenship of heaven. And then you find out the Bible says we're the filth and offscoring of this world. The world has no respect for us. If they hated him, they're going to hate us. The way of the king. And, I, and again, I don't want that to make my message today, but think about that today. You think everything's going to be perfect and wonderful and everything's going to turn out great. And in the end, it does because we rule and reign with Jesus. But on this earth, the way of the king is going to take you to the cross. It's a life of crucifixion. It's a life of self-sacrifice. It's a life of not people ministering to us, but us ministering and giving our lives to them as Jesus did. There's more to that today, I think, than we realize. Matthew 11, verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Watch verse 29, what Jesus says about himself. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Go with me quickly to Matthew 26. Meek and lowly in heart? Oh, let's just find out how meek, that is to say, controlled power, I believe is the best description of meekness. Jesus was not a weak, frail, sissy man. He was a man who was under the power and control of the Heavenly Father at all times. He said, I always do those things which please the Father. Matthew chapter 26, beginning verse 28, please. We see more. We see the way of a king here, not only refusing to take that place when he came in and they were crying Hosanna, and go into the palace and say, this is my kingdom, this is my throne, but we also see in Matthew 26 and verse 28, he begins to talk about why he really came to this world in that first coming. He said in verse 26, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. He took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink you all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for the many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it anew with you. Now, don't miss this. In my Father's kingdom. What was his thoughts on the whole time? It wasn't these earthly kingdoms. 
It was about that heavenly kingdom that he was part of and that he would return to once again when he rose from the dead. And can we say this? And one day that very kingdom will come down from heaven. As the Bible says, the kingdom of heaven will be with men and God shall dwell with them and be with them. Whew. Now I want you to see this again, the way of the king. His eyes were heavenward, not earthward. His kingdom was from above, the Bible says. And he goes in verse 28 and 29, and he begins to refer to the reason of why he actually came, and his focus was on that heavenly kingdom, not on the earthly kingdom. Go with me, if you would, to uh, verse 50. To verse 50. Now we know they've gone to the Garden of Gethsemane. He's praying there, submitting to the Father. Judas is now coming with a band of soldiers and are getting ready to capture him and to bind him hand and foot, the Bible says. In verse 51, it says, And behold, one of them, which were with Jesus, we know in another scripture, this is Peter, he stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. That's Malchus. Verse 52, Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Now, the way of a king. At this point, he could have easily said the word and had been over. Now, just get verse 53 for just a moment. Jesus said, Thinkest thou that I cannot pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? Now, what does that mean right there? Well, first of all, in the Old Testament, one angel killed, if I remember, 140 to 150,000 men. I forget the math. I didn't look it up today. One angel. And I, I'd like to just back up. Jesus didn't need any angels, by the way, to fight his battles. But he wanted to just get them to understand something. Because a legion at that time was 6,000 men. So he's saying, I could call 72,000 angels right now at a moment's notice and the Father would give them to me, and this whole world would be subject to me. But that's not why He came. He came to die. He came to give His life. In fact, look what Jesus said in Matthew, 20, uh, Matthew chapter 20, verse 26. Hold your hand there in Matthew 26, because we're going to come back. This is interesting. Now, can I say this? The ways of the Lord are right. Now, I know prophecy had to be fulfilled, but God would have been just in that moment to destroy all mankind. He could, he could wipe us out at any time, and He doesn't need an excuse, and He doesn't need a reason. Man does not deserve God's mercy in any way. Man does not deserve one breath of life that God gives to us every day, not one. He wouldn't have to explain Himself to anyone for anything at any time because He is the King. You know, often you guys have had bosses in this world. You don't question your bosses. You don't question those in authority. What they do is right. Matthew chapter 20, we find here what Jesus said about his life. They were asking about authority and being who in, who's going to be in charge. But verse 26, he says, But it should not be so among you. Whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give His life a ransom for many. So we find He did not come to be doing as the way of kings that had come before Him or that would come after Him, but rather He came to be a minister and not to be ministered unto. You know that word minister means to help or to aid. And where would the human race be today if God not had helped us through His eternal sacrifice on Calvary, we'd all be in hell. From the first to the last, from Adam to the last man that stands on the face of this earth, we'd all be in hell. The Bible says He gave Himself a ransom for all, all mankind. We go back to Matthew 26 here now. And we see, of course, He said, I could call 12 legions of angels. I mean, that would have been the way of the king. You know, nobody came before the king in the Old Testament or at any time in kingdoms here on earth and survived, especially one who would try to kill the king. 
Now we see in Matthew 26, verse number 59, please. Now the chief priest and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet they found none. At the last they came two false witnesses. Then they began to lie, didn't they? And said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God to build it in the three days. Of course, we know he was actually talking about himself. The high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? Verse 63. But Jesus, again, and I know I'm adding that word, but again he held his peace. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God, that thou tellest whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Now verse 64, Jesus did answer him. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, but watch. Watch this. Nevertheless, I say unto you, hereafter, hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. What was he saying? My kingdom is from above. This is that kingdom from Daniel that was prophesied. The kingdom that was cut out not with man's hands, but from heaven itself which will rule over all other kingdoms, which shall destroy all other kingdoms. And thank God, the Bible says, whose kingdom there will be no end. Doesn't seem like the way of a king, though, in this moment, does it? Certainly, again, he could have said to the high priest, I am the high priest. <laughs> I'm the one that's going to die for the sins of the world. You can't do anything. I'm the final atonement. But no, he didn't do that. Wonderful, wonderful truths we find here in the Word of God. Go with me now, if you would, to Matthew 27. Just a bit further, the way of a king. Not born in a palace or people of nobility. Didn't claim to be the priest at that moment, and say, I'm the one that's in charge. Didn't call the legions of angels. Didn't speak the words that it would have taken that day to establish His kingdom. No, He submitted Himself to the will of the Father to die for the sins of the world. Verse 50, uh, 2711, please. 2711. The Bible says there, And Jesus stood now before the governor, so before he was before the high priest and the council, which he certainly was greater than all those men, they couldn't have found any fault in him. The Bible says they didn't. The governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? Oh, now we're getting somewhere. And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. When he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. And Pilate said unto him, the governor, Hearest thou not how many things a witness they witness against thee? Hey, man, do you get what they're saying? You're going to die unless you justify yourself. But verse 14, he answered him to never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. You know, people are still marveling today about what Jesus did on Calvary. Hardly a week goes by that I don't think about the reality that Jesus Christ came into this world and people are still saying, why? Why did he die? Why did he die? What's to it? What of it, if you would? Well, there's a reason. Of course, we know. The governor marveled greatly, and people still today don't understand it. But thank God those of us who are saved, we do understand it. He was coming to die as a Savior of the world, and make no mistake about it, he's coming again the second time as the King of kings and Lord of lords. With great wrath and indignation, the Bible says, against them who know not the Lord. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We also find, when asked, is he king of the Jews? This could have been the time to say, okay, I am. Go on with me, if you would, to verse number 27. Then, they come 
And it says, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Now, I don't know about you, friend, but he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And if ever there was a time in righteous indignation that he could have said, I am that king. It was when they mocked him and put upon him king's royal garments and a crown of thorns and put a reed in his hand and said, Hail, thou king of the Jews. But he submitted to all of that. What kind of king would do something like that? Dear friend, today the reality of everything we've spoken of is a king that loved this world and was willing to die for the sins of mankind and for those who were lost. All of this for you. All of this for me. In fact, they cried out, Hail, King of the Jews. Hail, King of the Jews. Verse number 37. You know, actually, let's read down through here. Verse 32 31, and that after they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put on his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. Verse 33, and when they were coming to the place called Golgotha, that is to say a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled. Verse 36, and sitting down, they watched him there and set up over his head his accusation written, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Does that sound like the way of a king to you? No. No king would die. No king would be crucified. No king would lay down his life. Let me see something here. Psalm 24. Go over here for a minute. We just want to switch, switch gears just for a moment. Again, what were they thinking? Were they thinking this... Savior would come, this king would come and be in this form of a servant, as the Bible says, and humble himself and become of no reputation, but would humble himself and be obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Is this what a king would do? They weren't expecting that. Psalm 24 gives us four verses talking about the coming king, and Jerusalem to this day still has a gate that is shut up. It's not open. Because they're still waiting for their king. What Jesus did doesn't make sense for a king. But the reason for that is because they do not yet know him as their savior, as a nation of Israel. The Bible says in verse number 7, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Verse 8, Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Now, they're thinking, this is it. The Pharisees thought, hey, you're going to take all of our enemies. Rome's going to be subject unto us, just like the Bible says. All the nations, the heathen nations, will flow unto us. But you know, there was an enemy that had to be first destroyed, and that was sin and death. That's what it was all about first. Once that enemy was destroyed, and Jesus could die for the sins of the world, and go into the grave and raise again, that enemy had to be defeated before any earthly enemy. Because if earthly enemies would have just been defeated, there'd be no salvation for mankind. You see, God would have had a kingdom in His Son, Jesus Christ, but He would have had no subjects because we're fallen mankind without salvation. All we would be found in is our sin. So He could have set up His king as a king or kingdom as a king, but He would have no kingdom to rule over. Without subjects, you can have no kingdom. You see how profound that is today. He had to take care of death and sin, which kept us from being part of that ruling kingdom. Thank God He did for you and I, that we can rule and reign with Him. Again, His first coming was not to rule and reign. 
It was to die and to destroy that enemy of death and sin that reigns over man to this day without Jesus Christ. But the second coming, thank God, He's coming again to rule and to reign. Matthew 27, something interesting also back here. We're almost there. Matthew 27. The way of a king. Just really doesn't make sense. A king of glory. Matthew 27, verse 45. We find something interesting here for the first time. Jesus allows Himself to be aligned with the rich and with the noble the first time. And you know what it's concerning? Not His birth, not His heritage, not His life, but rather His death. Wow. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 45. We find there, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour, and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, or being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In verse 50, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And of course, we know in another scripture, the Bible says, He said, Into thy hands I command my spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. Verse 54. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly this was the Son of God, a king. And many women were there beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee and ministering unto him, among which was Mary Magdalene. Verse 57, when the even was come, there came who? A rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus, and then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Jesus had taken, Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth. Watch this, verse 60. The rich man laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock and rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. Dear friend, the one thing, the one thing that Jesus allowed himself to be identified with of the nobility class was only in his death. That'll floor your mind. He said it was really all about me coming into this world and dying. He had a rich man's burial. And then, thank God, Matthew chapter 28, they came, and the Bible tells us an angel came early in the week, descended from heaven, and rolled back the stone from the door. And verse 5, the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. Past tense. Thank God he died, not the death of a king, but the death of a sinner in place of us on a place called Calvary. Go quickly with me, first, uh, first Timothy chapter 6, and then we'll read two verses in Revelation and we'll be done. First Timothy 6, First Timothy 6. You know, the world still doesn't realize that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. First Timothy chapter 6. And if you're going through your Bible there, you have all the T's together right before Hebrews. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15. The Bible says there, Which in his times he, the Father, shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord. Of Lords. The Bible tells us there's coming a time when we will see that. Go with me to Revelation 17. The world will see that. In fact, the Bible tells us that they will go into the dens and into the caves of the earth and cry out for the rocks to fall on them, to hide them from the face of him that sits on the throne. Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Revelation 17. 
verse 14. The Bible says, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for He is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And they that are with Him are called and chosen and faithful. Thank God we have a King of kings and Lord of lords that is coming to reign. Revelation 19, 16. The Bible tells us the world will come together to fight against this king. But at this time, this judgment and what a king will do, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 19, Revelation chapter 19, go back with me, if you would, to verse 11. Revelation 19, 11, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. Relating to our Sunday school message today about what Jesus said about the Bible. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. That's us clothed in fine linen, white and clean, the saved. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. All this time he's not going to hold back. This time he's not going to refrain. This time he will speak judgment, and it will fall. And that with it he should smite the nations, and there it is, the fulfillment of Psalm number 2. He shall then rule them with a rod of iron and treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Verse 16, He hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, notice all capital letters, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let's stand for an invitation here just for a few moments. The way of a king. The way of a king, submitting himself, even though he was equal with God, the Bible says he took upon himself the form of a servant and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. I'm glad today that our king subjected himself to the wrath of man, that he could bear our sins, that he could be the savior of the world, but especially those which believe, if you have never, ever trusted Christ as your Savior, the Bible says you must be born again. Neither is there salvation in any other name. There is no other name given under heaven amongst men whereby we must be saved.